Hello, I am Michael Gaucher, and I'm building a .NET software application using Visual Studio 2022, C Sharp, and Microsoft WPF Framework. WPF stands for Windows Presentation Foundation, and it's used to uh, produce a visual application where you have the potential, you don't necessarily have to do this, but you have the potential to make the program have great visual fidelity, great appearance, and um, incorporate a variety of multimedia elements, such as video and um, highly refined text documents, text and documents. And so I've chosen WPF. Um, I am fully versed in Windows Forms. Um, I, I used Windows Forms for a number of years, but when WPF came out, you know, I decided I wanted to adopt that. And so I adopted WPF as soon as it came out because that, um, that gamification of user interfaces is quite appealing. And when you tap into the full capabilities of WPF, you can achieve a very world-class style software application on Windows. At present, the focus is on data binding. And data binding is where we're connecting uh, data in a program to a user interface, to user interface elements, and using the user interface elements in such a way where oftentimes it's going to automate the connection of that data into uh, a visual output, right? And so I'm going to approach data binding um, in a very um, straightforward way uh, using uh, iteration structures, using an iteration structure. And I'm also going to approach it using um, automatic data binding in WPF. And um, in that, that way, or in, or in that uh, second part, I'm going to make use of the knowledge of I notify a changed interface implementation. I'm not going to implement that interface. I am I'm simply understand what that in interface is and what um, the, the relationship uh, between dependency properties and that interface and the data binding infrastructure uh, is in WPF. Once upon a time, I read a very thick book from Charles Petzold. Uh, I think it was called Applications Plus Data. But Charles Petzold, um, he wrote that book. I also loved his, his, uh, his Windows programming book, right? Um, that showed you how to do Windows programming in Win32. That's very instructional, supremely instructional. It, it, it remains relevant even today, uh, even if you're using higher layer, higher layer frameworks, right? Because the higher layer frameworks, they all are based on the bottom layer frameworks, right? So it makes absolutely sense to know what you are indirectly dealing with. And the knowledge in the Windows programming book uh, from Charles Petzold, where he's using C and the Win32 API is absolutely useful in terms of the process of software development when you're using C-based APIs, C-based APIs. And you could be in Unix or Linux using C-based APIs for user interfaces all day long and it's the same process but we're using a higher level uh, interface um, API WPF and it has rules for how data can be more productively uh, linked to user interface um, rep user, user interface output so one of the gateways to getting this data that I'm going to use is stored procedures in SQL Server I am a huge fan of stored procedures. I say 99% of the time when you're using databases like SQL Server, Oracle, or DB2, and I've used both Oracle and SQL Server. I've also used Postgres SQL. When you're using databases like that, you absolutely want to take advantage of views and stored procedures. I'm not going to use views in this process uh, just given the simplicity of this process, um, 
I decided to exclude the use of views uh, from the implementation side on the database, but I absolutely insist on using store procedures. Store procedures have a multitude of benefits. You get a clear standardized interface between the program and the database. You are able to isolate the table definition from the way that table is accessed. See, I may want to change this table, but the way the program understands the, the data interface remains relevant in the overall schema of the database. And so store procedures, along with views, provide a way to, to do that. And store procedures are a great um, found foundation area in the database for tuning and performance optimizations. And you can incorporate non-SQL structures and facilities in a store procedure to achieve a variety of data transformation results. When you need to uh, tune your, your performance and tune your database and change the logical structures, uh, store procedures, what that does is it gives an application a very reliable and consistent means to access the database without disrupting the software application if you do it right. You can do it totally wrong by uh, writing dynamic SQL and your table definition changes. You can do it to totally wrong that way. And yes, there are migration procedures um, using a combination of link, language integrated queries, um, entity framework, and um, release control where you might be able to do that uh, with dynamic SQL um, and minimize disruption, but it's far easier when you use store procedures. And in SQL Server in particular, but this is also the case in Oracle, you can have saved query plans so that the optimal route to get to the data and to access the data, um, that, that uh, definition is associated with the store procedure so that um, you can improve performance even further. SQL Server Profiler is a tool that would help in that regard in terms of being able to attach to a database instance uh, through network protocol and watch the queries that are being issued and to optimize them therein. But um, there are other tools within SQL Server Management Studio that allow you to evaluate a query plan and also recommend uh, you know appropriate modifications and tunings and then you know you you got your uh, performance um, uh, tool for SQL Server that allows you to take um, the results of the SQL Server profiler and evaluate it using your full hardware resources to come up with the most optimal way to access the database. So that's an aside, that's in a tangent, but um, store procedures are going to feature in this process of getting data linked uh, from the database to the program. And I'm going to run the program and incrementally test where we are when it comes to linking um, data to the program. I know earlier I mentioned um, that I wasn't going to incrementally test, and that was true of the types of data structures that I have in a place for um, the C sharp side of things, where I'm basically transforming data uh, totally within C sharp. But when it comes to interacting with the database, um, I'm much more of a proponent of reversing that where you may know everything there is to know and let's not go too far with that statement, but you may know a lot about um, the database tools or database processes and that sort of thing. But because of its declarative structure and other factors, you are much better off testing more frequently when it comes to the database than with the application if all things being equal, that you know a lot about how you implement in the programming language and in that programming sphere 
versus working in that data and that data querying, data modification sphere within a relational database. You're, you're well advised to stick to that and um, stick to that, that approach when it comes to testing. Hello, Dragonfly. Thank you for visiting. And um, yeah, keep, keep those other flies away because we, we don't need any of that. So let's run this program and let's see where we are in our um, data binding approach to get uh, the RSS reader off the ground. The data access layer is done and we want to build the user interface using the database. Right now we have essentially a blank canvas and we do have the tab control visual element integrated with the main window, with the window. And so the thought here is getting data from the database to generate tabs and I want to make the appropriate database call indirectly through the API we have set up so that the data comes through into this variable called feeds. And this feeds variable will then be accessed so that we get the unique list of feed names that will be used to generate the tabs. So on line 16 is where we're going to put the list of names sourced off of the feeds variable at line 13, sorry, line 14. And this is going to feed our for loop that we will use to generate the individual tab items and then the individual tab items will then uh, go into the tab control. So before we continue with the code, let's open up SQL Server and create the store procedure. And I'm going to try to do this a couple of different ways. Now, the video makes it look like SQL Server loaded pretty quickly, but it actually took a, a good while. So this is the store procedure definition for get all feeds. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try a little trick. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice little trick where you run a select statement and you see if it uh, returns what you expect it to return. And then you right click on the, on the select statement to bring up the query designer and, uh, and you know query editor. And what that will do is it will expand out that star. It'll take that star and it'll expand it out into the individual columns. And then you can exit out of the uh, query designer, query editor, and you can then modify the auto-generated select statement or fully with the fully qualified names or the individual uh, column names. They're not actually fully qualified, but, and you can then format it. But I found that this method on a low-end computer it takes, a, it takes a little bit uh, a long time compared to uh, doing the same on a higher end computer. So I just thought I'd try it out and see what that looks like. And, um, you know, remember the background part of this process is to evaluate performance on a low end computer when doing these types of tasks. And so there are certain tasks that are more productive than others. So that concludes that query definition so and that sort of procedure definition so then I said okay I want to expand out the tables and um, right click on the feeds article table in order to um, just script it and that the expanding the tables took so long that I thought I'd use information schema to see if I can do a little ad hoc code generation um, and yeah I was able to get the columns faster than it took for the tables to expand out on the right on the left hand side but when it finally did come through us like yeah let me go ahead and and do it that way since I waited all that while for it to come back and so 
So I like this method better of right clicking on the table object on the left side and then generating uh, the, the query that way because I, I find that to be super accurate and super quick and all the field values are quoted and you have less issues that way. And so both store procedure definitions are done at this point but I want to look at them in the uh, object view and make a slight modification to get all feed articles right and so I want to I want to bring back the data in a certain order right and so by default SQL Server will return the data in the order that it was added to the table but I want to bring back the feed articles by feed name and then uh, by date time and then by URL to break the tie if there's a tie on date stamp. So the reason why I want to uh, bring back the data in this case in sorted order is so that when I am bringing the data back from the database into the application, it's going to make my sorted list type operate more efficiently. And so that's going to be a, a small performance enhancement that I can do up front that will allow um, the, the give give a few um, extra uh, you know milliseconds in time it's, it's, you know it's not substantial but you know architectures can evolve over time and if you make good choices in the beginning you have less work to do downstream in order to um, make better things happen so there's the for loop that I was talking about earlier that is going to generate you be used to generate the tabs the individual tabs one tab per feed and so keep in mind that um, on the taskbar you'll see a little question mark inside of a blue circle that's the that is the Microsoft help viewer I have loaded in the background and so you know if I get any um, of the property names wrong I can always refer back to that help viewer. IntelliSense is useful, but you can spend just as much time trying to rotate through possible options as it would be um, to, or you could spend less time uh, looking it up in the uh, documentation than it would be to try to do uh, guess the right name by trial and error. And so um, I, I do think that IntelliSense works better when you know more about what you're looking for than if you are uh, you totally don't know it all so we're gonna run this program now that we have uh, our for loop in place to generate our tabs and we have our store procedures in place and fortunately uh, running Visual Studio in a debugging debugging mode is so slow on an Intel Pentium processor that it gives me enough time to even talk about this process now so if we were on an Intel Core i5 or Intel Core i7 things would be a little bit different notice I don't mention the core Intel Core i3 in any of these videos this is the first one and yeah that is an improvement over an Intel Pentium but you know so we do have an error and basically we got all the code for the data access layer in place, but we missed one line of code. And that is to open the database. So you gotta have an open connection to the database. So I need to make that change in get all feed items and get all feed article items. So once I have those two changes in place, then we can run the program, get the data back from the database, feed that into the user interface, that for loop then would have the requisite uh, data to step through in order to generate a tab per feed item should feed items exist which at this point we know that they do so there's the window and I see a orange thin line which indicates something is there but either we don't have the layout defined correctly in WPF or we don't have data coming back from the database even though everything is syntactically and technically correct, or we don't have the right uh, uh, invocation for the user interface. We don't have the right objects for the user interface. We're missing something. And in this case, it is that last option. And so 
even though everything looks good in terms of that for loop, yes, we are generating tab items and I'm adding the tab items to a, to a collection, right? And so everything's good that way, but something's missing. So I go to the help file to see and figure out what it is I'm missing. And I spend uh, a couple of minutes here. The documentation is very extensive in Microsoft Help Viewer. And I found it very useful. But in this case, I did not find what I was looking for. So the documentation got my mind going in the right direction. And I was able to recall what I read uh, essentially 12 to 15 years ago um, regarding the uh, items collection associated with certain items controls. So I decided to make that modification based off of experience and memory alone and see what that looks like. And Visual Studio on an Intel Pentium processor with the debugger mode uh, in operation, yes, does take a bit. And I see success here when it comes to the tabs. So, so we're able to move forward and our for loop was very useful. And so now, um, and so I know that the tabs control has a background and that background is going to be more filled out. And what keeps me going on this is knowledge of our requirements. And it's helpful in this, you know, in this process to refer back to our requirements. And that's essentially what we have here. This is the screenshot from the Linux version of the program. And I want the left side of the screen to roughly look that way. So the objective here is to get that part uh, working. And so I'm going to open up the XAML file and my intuition here is I need to change the orientation from vertical to horizontal. Now, the reason why it's not really an, an intuition, I it's based off of what I've studied, but when it was in a vert, vertical orientation and there is no content in the uh, body of the tabs control, then it's essentially going to shrink, right? Now, you could force it by putting in an explicit height, but that's not recommended. So by switching it to horizontal, then that makes the, the panel work with where it um, is going to fill up the, the area from top to bottom. And then um, that, that particular insight is uh, useful here. I did not like maximizing the screen when we ran the program. So I would be, um, it, it's just the preference where I would uh, like to have the, the window open up already maximized and filling up the screen. And so I think that will be helpful in this case. So gonna set the window state to maximized, right? And so I also like setting the window startup location to center, but when it's starting up maximized, there's almost no use for that, but I say almost. So let's run it one more time. And we are going to see uh, everything the way we want, and we have success. On to part three, where we expand on headlines and articles.